it's all okay. Awesome. Well, I can go ahead and kick off the recording then and I'll pass it off to Divya to you to then kick it off to Jason, if that sounds great. Cool. Um, all right. Well, hi, everyone. Welcome to our um, July 24th instance of the CNCF IoT Edge Working Group. Uh, we are a CNCF working group, which means we abide by the CNCF Code of Conduct, which can be distilled down to be a kind, decent person. And we are going to record this meeting. So if you're not comfortable with having that yourself recorded, you can um, go ahead and go off video or you can hop off and we post these all to the Runtime Tag YouTube channel. Um, and with that, our um, agenda item for the day is to learn about Edge Image Builder um, from both Divya and Jason. Um, and I'll pass it off to Divya to tell us a little bit more about that. So fun fact, uh, it's major thanks to Leon who noticed the socials for our Rancho Live that we're here. So firstly, thanks Leon for having us here and for reaching out because um, I would have never considered actually coming on and speaking about this or um, pressure Jason to come on and speak about this um, uh, in this uh, in any case. So um, for those of you or who did not see the Rancho Live episode, which um, streamed, I think, a couple of weeks back. Uh, the Edge Image Builder project is um, an open source project built under um, the SUSE brand. Um, uh, and uh, we basically have a whole, um, you know, presentation lined up, which I'm not going to take away from because I tend to ramble more than I think I do. So I will just hand it over to uh, Jason to kick us off and get into the details and the demo and whatever else is there for y'all. Uh, Jason, do you want to take over? Yes, I am think I'm hitting permission issues. That's not letting me share to Zoom, so I might have to reconnect. Apologies. Let me see what happens. Yes, I'll be right back. I just have a quick question while um, Jason's gone. Um, I'm actually trying to share the link, but somehow it's really not um, showing me the correct link here. Um, is there is there a workaround to this? Because I was able to join um, and I'm using the invite link that is there on Zoom. Yeah, I did not use that one. I used the CNCF tag runtime one. Which... Yeah, so there's, um, we have two... Maybe I posted the wrong one here, potentially. Okay. Check. Um, no, that should be the right one. All right. Um, because uh, several people, not just Jason, ha having trouble, but I was able to log in fine, so I'm just worried, like, yeah. what did I do? So, right. Yeah. So the issue there was that um, we were previously a Kubernetes working group. And so our Zoom was owned by Kubernetes. And now we're a CNCF working group. The CNCF calendar has yet to update. I've been trying to figure out the best way to do that. Um, so within our working group channels and um, GitHub and all of that, it's been updated. But the formal CNCF calendar has not. So if someone went to the CNCF calendar, they won't be able to get in. But if they, um, Leon sent an update in the email thread and in Slack, that's the updated one. So that's the confusion there. Yeah, thank you so much. That that clarifies a lot. Jason, I'll again hand it over to you. Uh, was just asking why you were unable to get in earlier. Um, and I was, so yeah. Uh, can you see my slides? Okay, good. Uh, sorry, apologies for that. We're not a Zoom shop over here. So but when I turned it on for the first time in like six months, it's like, oh, I have a bunch of updates and I've removed all of your permissions to be able to do anything fun. All right, let's get started. Um, so uh, let me start with a quick introduction. Uh, my name is Jason Obies. I am a director of engineering at SUSE. Um, prior to that, I spent a little time at Google. And prior to that, I spent a solid 15 or so years at Red Hat. Um, even before that, I've been working in open source software. So this is something that um, being able to speak to this community, being involved in this community has, is something that's always been very, very important to me. Uh, I started with Kubernetes back at my Red Hat time um, around 2017. I was trying to think of about when it started, 2016, 2017, um, and have been involved in it, barring that little time at Google, pretty much ever since. 
Um, a lot of that time is spent in, spent in developer advocacy. And now, like I said, I'm a, uh, back in the engineering world over at SUSE. In fact, I'm going to start off a little bit about SUSE in a second. Um, so I want to talk about um, what it is we were trying to solve. Uh, this deck is somewhat reused, so you're going to see me breeze through a lot of the general what is edge stuff, because I imagine this call knows. But at the same time, it's a big enough landscape and it's a new enough topic where I want to at least mention um, kind of our take on it and why we needed to create something like Edge Image Builder. Uh, and then talk about what it is. And in terms of a demo, um, I'll talk to it when we get to it. I have some recordings I can show you. Uh, I do want to mention I like Zoom meetings like this. I have chat open on the side monitor. So if you see me glancing away, that's what it is. But that also means please, please feel free to drop questions in as they come up. Um, we can try to orchestrate them, but typically I've been doing remote presentations for a while now, even before COVID. So I've gotten fairly used at, to um, keeping an eye on it and answering questions when I can. In other words, don't worry, you're gonna interrupt me. I'll, I'll adjust them when I can and kind of go back when it makes sense. Um, so let me talk about Edge at SUSE. And I wanna be very clear from the start, this is not a marketing or a sales pitch. Uh, I am an engineer. I'm here to talk about nerd topics. Um, so rather than talk about SUSE products or anything like that, I want to give you an idea of our interest in Edge and um, why you're hopefully going to see a lot more than just me floating around in the near future. Uh, so I was hired uh, February of last year. I was the first engineer on a brand new Edge, really, department uh, inside of SUSE. Um, and in that time, we have grown to probably close to 13 to 15 engineers now um, doing a variety of tasks, but all in the edge space. We're looking to continue to grow that. Um, this is a big deal for SUSE going forward. Uh, and again, I'm not saying this is a marketing pitch. I'm saying this is an idea of the, the scope of the amount of resources we've had behind it. Um, that is not a large team to be doing something as kind of wide as edge. So we have, um, had some absolute rock stars on the team uh, who've been able to produce a lot more than, than any single human being should be able to. Um, but it also means that, um, like I said, I, I hope this is the beginning of you seeing a lot more of us uh, talking about these efforts and engaging in the upstream communities. We sponsored the Edge Day at the last KubeCon um, in, where was that? That was Europe. Um, the one before that in North America, I went to and I came home and I was like, guys, we have got to sponsor this. We've got to be part of it. Um, and I was happy to see we're, we're growing our presence there. So uh, a fairly small as of right now, but definitely growing initiative inside of SUSE is to build out this edge stack. All right, it's enough lizard. So um, again, I'm not going to spend a ton of time on what is edge because I imagine this working group would know. Um, I will say that we were much more concerned with um, a few aspects of it. Air gapped is one of the biggest things that hit us from day one. Um, and I say hit us because from an engineering perspective, as you guys all really know, uh, that makes things considerably more difficult than if we were able to just assume a solid network connection. Um, so air gapped and really low uh, bandwidth situations were one of the issues that we were trying to solve with this. So we have all of these remote systems that uh, are not necessarily going to be treated in the same way they are at a data center that we can just say, here, here's some repo configuration, here's some puppet configuration, go and let it install itself. Um, that was one of the things we were looking to solve. Uh, another was the scale. So we are uh, have aspirations toward this tiny edge and your small retail markets of um, you know one to two machines. We, we've two node HA has been something that has been thrown around this team for since almost its beginning um, because we have people asking for these very small footprint. Um, think a coffee shop and a barista is not necessarily going to be an IT admin that is going to be able to do your Kubernetes maintenance and things like that. So how do we handle these types of large scale, really, that doesn't have a dedicated IT department to it? Um, and again, I'm, I'm painting this in the picture of what Edge Image Builder in particular is trying to solve. We have solutions uh, much more catered toward telco, and we do have um, work uh, going on with Aukri for IoT, but that's not exactly the space Image Builder plays in. Um, this slide, again, 
without going through all of it, the highlighted areas, the zero touch provisioning was a big deal that we were trying to fix of, all right, we need to be able to have these systems out there, but not have someone on hand that can do a lot of um, fine-grained control and provisioning of them. We also needed to be able to bundle as much of the information or, or the data necessary to provision them at uh, install time or at first boot time. Um, so the initial network constraints that is uh, highlighted on here, again, this is the air gap situations. This is the low bandwidth situations. Uh, I'm sure this group knows it, but I'll say it out loud anyway. It is very cool. Uh, it is a giant pain to have to think about things like satellites and uh, ships in the middle of the ocean that lose bandwidth, but it also makes for a really cool story of, yeah, you know, we're sending stuff up to satellites and we are not uh, getting our gigabit connections that we've all kind of become used to. Um, so in this zero touch provisioning, we have broken it down into, for our perspective, three different means. Um, number one, the idea of we know the hardware and we want to use something to bootstrap that hardware to turn it on, to do detection of what's running on it, and then full-blown provision it. And that's where Image Builder plays into that story, where the image of what gets out there is we also want to carry the user workloads in any configuration necessary. Flip side, we want to be able to have a USB stick that we plug into a machine or just have a um, hardware vendor uh, burn an image onto the machine that when it starts up, it automatically calls back to your enterprise and says, hey, I'm here. I belong to you now. You can manage me. And the third is just a standalone cluster. It's also our installation mechanism for the management cluster. Um, and a lot of where you're going to most readily see where Image Builder factors into it is this image-based provisioning, where we want to be able to do all the definitions of our Kubernetes cluster, the underlying operating system, the user workloads, get them onto the image, and then just once it boots, it's ready to go. There's no second step necessary. It is zero touch. It's right there in the name. So what is it? Um, it? It's a little weird going through that much motivation without giving you an idea of what it is we're talking about. So the easiest way of explaining it is it's a standalone tool. Um, right now it is a CLI. We've had murmurings of, oh, it'd be cool if we slapped a GUI on it. And we've all said, cool, but that is not a priority for the foreseeable future. Um, and it is for customizing currently SLE micro images. And I know that is obviously a very SUSE-based um, approach, but keep in mind the size of the team. And we were really three of us working on this since about September of last year. So aspirations do stretch much further than just this very SUSE-based um, option. Uh, with the idea, the concept is absolutely there, but due to time constraints um, and uh, customer needs, you know, I, I like getting paid because I like eating food. So our customers are using Slee Micro, that's what we were gonna start with. Um, but the overall idea is we start with a base image, we run it through Edge Image Builder, and it does a number of configurations that are applied at first boot. Anything from uh, installing RPMs to configuring users on the operating system, all the way up to establishing a full-blown HA Kubernetes cluster and uh, doing all of the network configuration needed by that node. So uh, the technology underneath the covers is currently combustion. Uh, we have looked into ignition and cloud in it as other options. Um, as of right now, combustion for a variety of reasons is what we started with, but again, um, looking to expand this in the future. This green area, this one image, multiple deployments was absolutely huge to us. Uh, we can't have 10,000 machines managed with 10,000 different images. Uh, there was no way the scale was going to work that way. So uh, the idea was to be able to customize an image in such a way that, let's talk about an HA Kubernetes cluster, just three nodes. That one image can provision all three of those nodes and have them understand their particular role, how to access the others, how to join the cluster, how to pick um, if we had a fourth or a fifth node, which ones of those are outside of the control plane or actually worker nodes and so forth. Um, and that was a big driving factor for us, is that we cannot have this gigantic image sprawl of one per node. There was no way that was ever going to work. Uh, so um, let's start with this slide, uh, and then I'll go back to the previous one. Uh, the idea is, uh, again, Image Builder, it's the CLI tool that you run locally. 
you feed in an image definition, which is a YAML file, and then a set of configuration files, which are anywhere from completely optional up to as detailed as you need them. For instance, to configure um, something like networking, you would have a variety of files describing the different networks going on, the different nodes. Um, for Kubernetes and the distros we chose so far, you could include configuration that files that get dropped directly into the distribution and so forth. Um, and then again, currently we start with a Slee micro image. We use the information in the two blue icons there to make the proper adjustments. And that side of it pops an image on the other side. Uh, if you started with an ISO, you get an ISO. If you started with a raw image, you get a raw image. But the idea is that when you first boot it, um, it will run through all of the configurations and customizations Image Builder did. So it'll add your users, it'll configure NTP, it'll configure your network, uh, and so forth on that first boot. And then that way, once it finishes, your node is ready to go. Um, and it has the configurations you need, it has the user workloads on it, you can uh, add Helm charts in there and manifests, you get Kubernetes workloads deployed. And it goes back to the idea earlier of zero, uh, zero touch, that once the image is out there, it does everything it needs to do, including calling home if necessary, including installing dependency RPMs, um, and it's ready to go uh, from there. Uh, thank you, Stephen, for the combustion stuff. That's awesome. I love the color commentary when I talk, so I don't have to dig up my own links because doing two things at once has just never really worked for me. Let me go back to some more technical details. Um, it's distributed as a container image. Uh, that makes our installation significantly easier because the amount of things that we need to customize an image this way is non-trivial. Uh, we're using things like live guest FS to crack open the image, um, a variety of things to rebuild it. Uh, the RPM dependency resolution in and of itself has its own set. So just a single container image to run image builder. Um, currently x86 support, uh, x86-64 support only. We are in tech preview for it running on ARM64 as well. Um, the trick there is the cross compilation. So we ultimately are trying to get to a point where say on my Mac, which is um, Arch64, I want to be able to build an x86-64 image that is going to be used in my lab or something like that. We're currently in the progress of looking into it. It is about as much of a headache as you would think it is. Um, fully open source, that is uh, just how SUSE does things. We want to continue that. You can see the GitHub repository down below. Um, the issues there is very, very active, uh, as is our documentation on there. So if this is something you go and try out, by all means, engage with us if you run into problems or limitations with the issues, and we'll take a look at it. And since this is a nerd audience, I can talk a little bit about um, what we've gone through to, uh, to to actually build it. So it is a Go-based uh, application, but Combustion is basically Bash script um, uh, based. So we are generating a lot of shell scripts that get run at Combustion time. We are also shelling out into our container to use libguestfs uh, to do a variety of manipulations on the file system of the base image and so forth. Uh, we can go back to that if you all want by the end of the call, um, but for now, it's kind of a high-level touch on it. Okay, so what is it capable of doing? Um, at the operating system level, uh, we can configure users and groups. Users can have passwords or SSH keys associated with them, uh, a fair amount of uh, other things. It's it's not even too, too worth um, reading this out loud because that's not the most interesting thing for, to say. But the point is, as of right now, we have a number of base level operating system things that can get configured. And again, this is through the definition. So there's this YAML file that you create for that defines, this is the image I want EIB or Edge Image Builder to create. Uh, and here are the, the details of what I want you to do to that image. Here's where things get a little more interesting. So we can specify a list of packages that we want to be installed onto the image when it boots. Now again, air gap was a requirement from day one, which made everything much trickier at the start, but it also got a lot of this out of the way early before we went down any uh, weird paths but it will fully determine all of your RPM dependencies and embed those in the built image as well. 
So if I want something simple like wget to be available on my node, I would specify to edge image builder, yeah, include the wget package. And what it does is fetches the RPM, the binaries, uh, includes it inside of the image. And when that image boots, it installs the wget RPM uh, and everything's good to go. Something more complex that is going to have dependencies, EIB will determine all of those dependencies at build time. So on your local machine, when I say build this image, it's gonna look through and say, these are the extra RPMs I need. Um, I imagine most of us have worked in, in a Linux world here where you say, I wanna install one thing and it comes back and says, great, here are your 700 dependencies that we also need to install to get that working. All of those are gonna be prefetched by image builder and included in this uh, ready to go image. And then when it boots, it has all of the bits available. So if you are on low bandwidth or you are in an air gap situation, uh, it's going to take all of that into account. All of that should be accessible from the node when it boots. Uh, that second bullet point, uh, if you don't have things in a repo, if we have a customer or something like that that has just a single policy RPM or something, they can also just inject that into the image through the configuration directory. Um, that was part of the uh, this middle piece here where these extra configuration files, we're going to come back to that a couple different times on how you add in more customized um, types of fields into the image. Uh, so node registration, uh, again, due to lack of resources, we started with SUSE products, but the aspiration here is that any kind of call home mechanism should be supported by Image Builder. So as of right now, we can say either through Elemental, which is uh, a SUSE product for basically inventorying and then further updating um, rancher clusters uh, or SUSE manager for packages. Networking, um, this one was really cool. One of a really bright engineer worked on this. Uh, so we use Network Manager and our own format inside of the image configuration directory to say, okay, so for this MAC address, I want you to apply this network configuration to it. Host name, IP, all the stuff you would expect to see. All of that for all of your expected nodes get bundled together and put inside the image. And at boot time, it detects which MAC address you have set to configure and it configures it appropriately. Um, so if you, uh, I shouldn't even say if, when you have custom network things that are not just look for DHCP and, and hope for the best, all of that gets baked into the image. And then at boot time, uh, it selects the appropriate configuration, applies it to the machine. And then when it boots, it uses that network configuration. Uh, again, highlight in green, the one image, multiple node. This was, um, one of the biggest things that we kept coming back to is when we start looking at the scale of really edge in general, it, this is certainly not just an us problem uh, that everyone is bumping into. If we have this many nodes, we do need to have them somewhat customized, but at the same time, it does not make sense to make a bespoke image per machine in our, in, in our edge-based inventory. Kubernetes, uh, one of the main reasons I'm talking to this group, uh, we support Kubernetes installations uh, starting with RKE2 and K3S. Again, that one image per cluster, the idea being you specify uh, which of your nodes should be workers versus control plane, uh, and then some extra configuration if necessary. It's completely fine if you just wanted to do uh, a single standalone node. And at boot time, it will detect the node it's running on and choose the appropriate um, persona, I guess, for lack of a better word, uh, and install the necessary pieces and configure itself to the cluster. And if we get to the demo uh, later, you'll see in the recording that uh, we do just that. We have a two node cluster set up. I boot two other VMs from uh, the same image and you see them come online and register themselves with the Kubernetes control plane and then poof, they're ready to start serving workloads. Speaking of workloads, uh, it was really cool when we got uh, the ability to configure the operating system and to install Kubernetes, but really that doesn't get us anywhere unless we have workloads running on that Kubernetes cluster. The empty cluster problem just doesn't really give us any kind of benefit. Um, so there's the ability to uh, specify manifests or Helm charts at build time and say, hey, I want these to be included in the image and installed once Kubernetes is running on the node itself. Um, to do this, uh, it's similar to the RPMs in the sense that 
we will look through the manifest in the helm charts, determine all of the images necessary, and then download them and shove them inside of the newly built image. So the bits are available at boot time. Um, saves all of the network hit of downloading the manifest binary, shouldn't say manifest binaries, the manifest image binaries um, necessary because they're already included on the box at runtime. It boots up, Kubernetes gets installed, and then we go through the process of applying the manifest and Helm charts to get those workloads out there as well. Um, custom files and scripts. This is kind of our safety valve for anything that is not formally supported by EIB just yet. Uh, and this has actually progressed a little bit in the development branch. Um, Right now you can include, we'll start with the custom file. We'll start with the custom scripts actually. In the image configuration directory, you can drop in as many bash scripts as you want to be run at combustion time. We use a very simple, simple, simple prefixing mechanism to make sure our bits uh, run in the order that we want them to. And then customers can just come in if they want to and interject in that. But anything that, um, someone has the need to do that we don't support through a first-class construct. Um, in addition to installing RPMs, if maybe they needed to, um, they a really bad job of thinking of an example right now, uh, other OS configurations or other types of installations, or if they need to um, tweak something or add in their own workflows, all of that is available. Uh, you just write the scripts yourself, you drop them in and they get included at run at combustion time. Files is very similar where they are included in the image. So that way, if your custom script has to run a separate binary, you just include both of them and they get executed for you at runtime. Um, so it's obviously a very needed feature, but this also is our kind of safety valve for anything we haven't explicitly added to EAB yet is still addable with a little extra work on the user's part. And then obviously over time, we want to continue to grow the first class citizens as well. Um, keeping an eye on chat, not seeing any questions yet, follow me and drop them in, um, but I will keep going with the demo. Um, and before I start, uh, I've done I, I developer advocacy for Kubernetes for about five or six years. Uh, and I've had the opportunity to do some really cool demos with things like the auto scaler, um, things that really wow an audience when you're like, watch, I press a button and all of a sudden the pods now scale up to 50. Uh, this is not that cool of a demo uh, because at the end of the day, what we are doing is building an image and then showing you that everything built in the image executes. Um, it is can be slightly time consuming, so it's all going to be video based um, because uh, I'm, I'm interesting, but I'm not interesting enough to vamp for the four minutes for multiple VMs to boot and register themselves with Kubernetes and so forth. But I wanted to at least paint the picture of what it looks like using this and what to expect to come out of it. So to start with, uh, I mentioned everything is driven by an image definition. Uh, this is not even the smallest possible image definition you could include. In fact, if you skip the entire operating system uh, section on here, we would still build an image. It just wouldn't have any customizations done to it. Um, but really, for this demo, I started with something very small. Um, for the operating system, on SLE Micro, we wanted to automate the ISO installation. Uh, so right now, if you were to just install it manually, it asks you, hey, do you want to install? And you have to press enter, and then you have to select a disk. We circumvent that uh, because, again, zero touch provisioning. We don't want to wait for a user to press a button. We want this to automatically run. And then I drop in uh, a simple uh, user, uh, a simple password for root user so I can actually log in. Obviously, it's been truncated for readability because nobody wants to see a whole bunch of characters uh, fly across their screen. Inside of this image configuration directory, I touched on that earlier, these two pieces necessary to build an image. The definition set defines many of the details involved in the image, including uh, the base image that we're building from, the architecture, and so forth. The configuration directory is where we're going to provide that base image. Uh, so you can see here we have a SLE micro ISO that we are customizing. That's going to uh, be the basis of which we create the new ISO from. And then I have some simple custom scripts in here. The root shell is because after 20 years of using Linux, I've been conditioned to type LL, and that is not a default alias on C Micro and driving me insane. So on all of my images, I simply alias LL to 
ls-l because um muscle memory is just way too deep there for me to try to fix on my own and then i'd originally done this uh slide deck for a presentation at susicon all that shell script is going to do is drop a simple message of the day that says hello susicon and we'll see a different one that shows that it was actually built and run by eib so what we're looking at here is just the uh, actual building of the image itself. Uh, like I said, it's a container image. So we use Podman to run it. At the top here, we mount in uh, a directory. Now that is the image configuration directory. That is this code edge EAB. Uh, and that makes it has two purposes. Number one is it gets all of the configuration files into the container, but it also gives the container a place to put the image so that way the user can get it back out. Um, we specify the definition file, so you can have multiple. If I say I want to build um, my QA images versus development, or if I want to do one that only has specific features, uh, all of that is driven. Um, <laughs> thank you. Good. Someone else appreciates me on that whole LSL thing. Yeah, it's too, too many years now. Um, speaking of which, you see me do it on the, the demo right now. Let me get back to the end here. Uh, one of the things I talked through while it was running was this download step. So part of the later on in the demo, we see I've included um, some Kubernetes workloads to be installed. This populating the embedded artifact registry is the process that Image Builder goes through to download all of the necessary binaries for those images. Um, store them on the image, but then also configure on the node itself a local image registry. And basically, what we do is we just use the manifest as is, and we overwrite the registry endpoint to pull from a local registry running on the node itself. A uh, few other things going on, nothing spectacular. And then you can see at the end that we have this new image built for us. In this example, it is uh, an ISO. So uh, you'll see in the coming demos when we're going to boot it, it's going to quickly run through the ISO installation. OK, step two of the demo, let's take it up a little bit. So we have our two stanzas from the first part, uh, the installation device and then our basic user. Now I specify some packages we want to install. Uh, back to the wget example, because that's nice and simple. And then um, this debug info, this is one of those packages that we just started using during testing and somehow just ended up becoming the de facto demo uh, RPM as well. The important part there is it comes from a separate repository. Uh, this is a truncated URL, uh, and obviously the SEC registration code is removed as well. But that will register itself with uh, SUSE's SCC to download packages from there, but we also provide additional repository information. So you can get packages from wherever you have them hosted. And that's where the RiserFS um, package is gonna come from, uh, the separate repository. So we can see here, and hopefully this is visible to y'all, uh, it's a recording so I can't really zoom in. On the left side, we have the first node is already running. Uh, on the bottom right, I had triggered a second node to start simply to show that, yes, it's automatically running the ISO installer. Um, very, oh, shoot, it reset. Uh, but back on the left, you will also notice the configured with Edge Image Builder. I hope that's readable. Um, that is just something that Edge Image Builder timestamps out. I'm sorry, not timestamps. Um, marks out to each image it creates so that way we know what version of the IB was used to build it. It's also the good first indication that, yeah, okay, Image Builder actually did work and is triggering combustion on this image. Ignore the Git and SHA. I did this off of the development build. This should say something nice like 1.0, 1.1, and so forth. The second line in here, the welcome to SUSECON 2024, this is proof that my custom script is working, uh, as is me running LL on here uh, later on in the demo. But we're already starting to see that as this image booted, uh, or as the node booted from the image, all of that configuration um, was applied and made available to us. Now remember, this part of the demo was talking about RPMs in particular. So we do a quick check to show that wget and this riserfs were installed on the node. We see wget come up, we'll see the riserfs uh, RPM is, appear as well. And then in the bottom right, as that second node starts to boot, 
really the takeaway here is you're not going to see anything particularly different than a normal boot. Um, it's ultimately going through all of the steps of installing the RPMs and the other configurations. But once that comes up, we're able to quickly log into it and show the same thing that we have WGET and the riser FS. Okay, networking. Um, so again, networking works with um, uh, Network Manager. You define a series of files for each node that you want to configure the networking for. Um, I'll stop the inevitable question now that right now this image will only work on the four nodes in question. We do know that we need to make this more extensible. Same thing for the Kubernetes um, HA functionality. Um, we would like to be able to make this a little more wildcard based and like a default type of option that says, hey, if we don't have a specific override, this is the network configuration to use. Lack of time and resources. As of right now, we're going to ultimately have four nodes running in this demo. Each of them is going to have their own network configuration file. You can absolutely define four nodes and only end up provisioning three, uh, which is actually, we'll see that in the demo. It's a great question. I'll pause it when it starts and you'll see that I believe two of them are running before I start the third. Um, this is what uh, one of these files looks like. Obviously, I don't expect you to read it, but just kind of loosely glancing over it, you see what you would expect to see out of network configuration. Um, the important parts for this demo is the mapping of the MAC address to the IP address. This is all run inside of my house, hence the 192s. Um, I also really enjoyed, this is such a dumb thing to get excited about, but the fun part about using VMs is I can manually make the MAC addresses. So they go from uh, AA, BB, CC, and DD. Um, if you don't trust me and you wanted to map the two back, you could see 201 up through 204. So what happens is uh, as the node boots, so we have, uh, and now I'm actually forgetting exactly what I did for the demo purposes here. For node one, uh, as it came up, you'll see it correctly sets the host name. It correctly sets the IP address to this 201 because it read the MAC address as AA. Now to Kate's question, uh, as I boot node two, it's gonna do the exact same matching. So it's gonna look at its own MAC address on this box, see that it is BB, apply the correct uh, 202. So to answer your question, I could be done here, in which case if nodes three and four never get started, that's completely fine. Um, it's more that we have the presence of the specific nodes that we want this explicit configuration set up for, and it just triggers once it runs and detects that. Oops, sorry. Uh, step three, uh, Kubernetes. So currently with our support for RK2 and uh, K3S, it is as simple as specifying the version you want in here. Um, this is slightly older than what we currently support, but it's like a month old and you guys know how things run around here. Uh, in this case, we're using our four nodes and setting up a three node HA cluster and then a single node uh, worker. So you see we have assigned that uh, for these host names. So the previous step, we mapped host names to MAC address. Now we're saying as we define our Kubernetes cluster, we want to take those hosts and assign them a role. Basically, are they going to be part of the server or are they going to be one of the workers? So in this case, we have our nodes one and two running from the previous demo. Uh, I do a quick kubectl get nodes to show that, yes, the two are in there. They are flagged as control plane boot node three and node four here. And as they start up, again, uh, to, to kind of really stress the point, everything is included on this image. So if I had wanted to, and we actually did tests of this in a fully air gap situation where nothing left that um, virtual host that these were running on, all of the bits necessary and all of the configurations necessary are included in uh, the image itself. So the image boots up. Uh, I spared some time there by skipping through to when they finished booting. We can see that if we do another kubectl get nodes, our all four nodes appear. One thing I didn't do properly was give me enough time to show that at the end of the demo. Uh, all four nodes have registered themselves. So if we talk through the time jump there, 
all I did was press start on node three and node four. And I literally just kind of stepped back and put my hands up. Um, and it went and uh, started those nodes. They did all of that first boot configuration, registered themselves with the Kubernetes cluster. Uh, and then the result of that was, yes, they are now available. Um, Orlin, that's a great question. We want to... Um, have more of this publicly. So, okay, short answer, we can't right now. Um, these are just basically on my laptop. Um, longer answer, we, I have a advocacy background um, and my manager actually uh, did a lot with uh, field uh, enablement. So between the two of us, we really are big on making things visible and we, we see the value in sharing these kind of things out. It's a time thing. Uh, I know that as soon as this came up, we all looked at it and said, yeah, we need to get this someplace. We just don't really know where yet. Um, and unfortunately have not quite had the cycles. Uh, to Divya's point, I think this is being re recorded. So you'd be able to get back to this particular spot. However, you bring up an interesting point. There may be a way of putting together a page on our GitHub repository where this is accessible because it would be useful to show you. Uh, another question, what happens if you boot one of the worker nodes before the control plane? Um, is there an order of boot that must be abided? I don't think so. I don't know that we've... Uh, well, okay. QA has probably tested it. I don't know that my team in particular has tested this. My guess would be the worker node would continue to try to call home to the control plane, say, hey, it's not there. I'm going to wait a little bit and try to call home again. Once the control plane came online, that call home would uh, complete. And I think at that point, we defer to basic Kubernetes functionality for, hey, my worker node is up and the agent is not, and the server is not there yet. Um, this also may vary based on distribution, uh, but I believe that the the general Kubernetes eventual consistency stuff will kick in there and um, it'll register itself once the control plane comes online. Um, you can hear me stuttering. It's because now all I really want to do is test that out and see what happens. So uh, if I do find the cycles to do that, I'll let you know in, in the uh, working group Slack. Uh, and then the user workloads. So again, building on the demo from the previous uh, couple of steps, we have a node right now, I'm sorry, we have an image right now that will set the root password so that we can log into it, not something you're going to do in production. Uh, it will install a couple of RPMs. It will establish the network configuration necessary for my particular house, and it will install a Kubernetes cluster. Again, we very quickly found that without user workloads, the cluster out there is cool, but not particularly useful. So right now we're going to show two different ways of installing Kubernetes workloads. The first is through Helm. Without talking through every field, a lot of this should look pretty much what you would expect from Helm though, that you define a repository, you define which chart and version you want uh, to pull from that repository. The other way of doing it is to simply have a directory in your image configuration directory that you drop these manifests to. Um, so I should have pointed out um, this, uh, the Helm chart is going to install MySQL, and then we're going to install Nginx through a manifest file. That is a standard issue Kubernetes manifest that you could kubectl create on uh, at any point. Again, from earlier, both of these at build time, we look through, determine any images necessary, uh, download them, and include them in the image. So all of those bits are executing directly off of the node itself. In fact, it uses a, a, a project called Hauler to stand up a individualized, basically single node artifact repository on the node that once these manifests and Helm charts start to run, it pulls from there instead of the live internet. Uh, so we're looking at our four nodes in the cluster here. Um, there's really not much to show beyond that because the workloads were applied as the node booted. So the timing for me trying to catch them was a little bit tricky. You can see I tried to do some fun here with killing one off and having it respawn. And then I forgot where I was in my demo and recorded it in this incomplete state. Point being, you can see the Helm installation pod and the MySQL instance is running. So that shows that the Helm portion of this was successful. And then the Nginx um, pods running are from the manifest itself. Uh, you don't have proof on here. You'll have to take my word on it that all of these bits were pulled locally from the node. Again, answering that uh, low bandwidth, no bandwidth situations for the air gapped. 
Uh, can we add, so question, can we add the labels for the node configuration so that we can manage the hardware requirement for the user workload or deploy the device plugin to expose? Um, maybe. Wow, that is a, that is a really confidence-inducing answer. Uh, it's something that we've definitely addressed as a need. Um, we are working with uh, people who have very heavy GPU-based workloads who are asking this exact question. Um, or deploy device plugin. No, so to that first point. Uh, Hello, Jason. Yes. Uh, so my 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 question was uh, so once it comes to the edge. We likely have like proprietary sensors and the hardware accelerations could be exposed by the device plugin, or you know we have to manage a, like a deployment based on these capabilities. So that was my original question. Okay, um, and yeah. before I answer that, your icon on Zoom is awesome. Um, not yet. Uh, it's on the radar though. Um, because we know that we, we do have, like I said, one guy in our team is focused very heavily on Acri. Our primary use cases due to time and resources right now have been much more telco based. Um, the device portion of it and that type of stuff is has under investigation. I don't know how much of it we have shown in action yet. And then the guy working on Acri is not me. Uh, so unfortunately, I can't speak too much about the kind of things he has done with these types of remote devices that you're talking about. Uh, I can say that in terms of the, the labeling and things like that, we want to support all of those Kubernetes features and, and really to be able to leverage them, um, right? Support's not even the right word, but to use those for um, a variety of things. Uh, for instance, uh, upgrade and day two operations to be able to use that to trigger how we do the rollouts of these upgrades and so forth. Okay. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. Thank Steven, you very much. You're very welcome. Uh, Stephen, yes, this is very, very much, um, I, man, it's so succinct and so much in that. Untrained, untrusted staff is so well put because we have had both of those in mind. Um, untrusted security is something that we are taking, it sounds dumb to say we're taking it seriously, but we understand the complications that this isn't a nice secure data center where we know who has access and so forth. And this is potentially running in some mom and pop shop someplace or a, a public retail that someone could feasibly walk out uh, with it. And there's, there's a lot of risk there. Um, but to the untrained, yeah, we also recognize that we are not going to have trained staff. Um, and this even goes back to our telco use cases where we have these remote cell sites that it doesn't make sense for Bob from IT to drive up there and have to handle all of this. Or Leanne working as a barista ends up um, also becoming a cube admin in her spare time. So uh, can these be used? Absolutely. Not only can it be used for it, it's actually very much the intention of it. Uh, if we go back to, and actually this is one of my last slides, so I don't mind jumping back. Um, the very beginning when we talk about, sorry for the flickering on the screen, y'all. Um, the three mechanisms here, so pushing out an image to bare metal hardware on the left side, the blue box, or the orange of the vendor installs this image that we just built through Image Builder and it calls home. Um, in both cases, the intention of Image Builder is to create that image used in those cases. So all of that data, all of that customization is present in it. How it gets out there um, is, is different options around, uh, I don't wanna make this a product thing. So different options for getting the images out there, but all of this is meant to be this zero touch provisioning because we don't expect to have necessarily trained people on site um, or trusted people on site. I'm going to completely steal that no staff or untrained, untrusted. Uh, install those from Helm charts in your config. Yeah, so. Yeah, yeah, okay, great. I'm loving the conversation there. Thank you all for continuing that one. Um, that is actually it for demo. Let me get up my final slide. Although thank you to uh, whoever was posting links in chat. I didn't look at the name. I just saw the links come up. Uh, again, to reiterate, uh, open source project. Uh, so we're up on GitHub. You can find the code at that first link uh, within that code base. Uh, and you'll find this from the readme as well, a building images guide that talks about 
uh, all of the available features. Uh, this was just a small subset that I can cover in 53 minutes where if you look at that building images guide, it's going to give you much more detail on the different OS level configurations, the different ways of setting up your networking. Networking in and of itself ends up having its own series of documentation for the different ways you want to set it up. Um, what we don't have right now is any kind of public roadmap. Um, we're still figuring that part out. But all of our issues, the, the source of truth is the Epstein repository. So as we get issues, we're filing them up there. And that's where we're picking things from and having the conversations. So if this is something of interest, um, obviously, if it's something of interest, feel free to reach out to me. I'm on the Kubernetes Slack. If you have questions or you want to engage more, if you do start playing with this, um, by all means, feel free to use uh, we, we are treating this as a real open source project. So use um, the GitHub issues to convey any issues to us. Pull requests are always appreciated, as always, in a uh, open source project. And uh, yeah, that's, I can't figure out how to stop sharing, otherwise I would. Uh, any other questions? Um, I have one, Jason. Uh, I was curious. I think you, first of all, this was a great presentation, and you did a really wonderful job of laying out how we get the first boot. And I'm curious, what does the update story look like? Do you have an AB update story with two node clusters? I'm sure Cappy is a little hard to figure out. So I was just curious, what what's y'all's solution there? Yeah, man, uh, yeah, there are probably currently discussions going on my engineering right now team fighting out exactly that because you're right, Cappy, Cappy does kind of complicate things. Um, we are actively working on that. Um, the base idea that we're working with is, um, geez, that's a very heavy question to answer too. Um, the workflow upgrading uh, Kubernetes, upgrading the operating system using, and this is where why I got a little thrown off with the labels question because so much in my head right now is how do we use labeling of the nodes in Kubernetes to do that rollout? Um, it's kind of talking around it because we are still figuring out a lot of it now. Um, we do anticipate that image builder will be used to um, build a lot of the, the replacement images that go out. Some of that is depending on other technology that we're creating as well. Um, the best I can say right now is it's a fantastic question. We're asking it ourselves. It's very, very difficult. Um, but we are, we're looking to really refine that story a lot more than what we have for this initial release. Yeah, I know. Um... Cappy defines upgrade as always rollout and not AB, like in place. But I remember, or at least that was the case like a couple of years ago, but I know there were some people who were trying to expand Cappy to support in place and AB. So I was kind of curious if, if you followed that and if there's any updates on whether that's now supported by Cappy. It's not to my knowledge, but we are... I feel nervous saying this out loud, but we are entertaining pushing on that because I know that just like you said, the discussions have happened and we are aware of the discussions and like, you know, if they go in a certain direction, our life becomes a lot easier. Um, and we're engaging with those now uh, and still trying to figure out uh, exactly how far we want to push on it. But to my knowledge, everything you just mentioned is still very valid and it's still kind of a fuzzy thing. Um, and it's also throwing off our overall upgrade story because of those three boxes I showed you and the cappy flow is wildly different from how we would handle really just a non cappy flow. Um, and as a small team with limited resources, we're like, okay, is there any kind of single solution? And it has yet to magically appear. Uh, any other questions? Wow, I didn't expect to go to time. Apologies for that. Cool. Well, thank you for your time. Um, great meeting all of you. Uh, like I said, I really, really hope that we find the cycles to become much more engaged with this working group because, um, as I said, SUSE has an entire team dedicated to this now that we are looking to grow, um, increase our presence in, but just increase just the value of it. It's, it's everyone here knows um, how big the edge space is, and that's why every one of these answers is well, it all depends, Cappy versus non-Cappy and so on. Um, so hopefully we'll see a lot more of us uh, floating around in the near future. Uh, if I make it to, I will continue to be in the Kubernetes Slack if you have any questions for me. Those of you at Edge Day, I'm really hoping to make it out to the Edge Day in, uh, where is this, Utah, Salt Lake City for this next KubeCon. Um, but when time comes a little bit closer to that, I'll start to reach out to you all so I can uh, get a chance to meet some people. 
Alois, thank you for the time. I really appreciate it. I know how hard it is to find an hour of your day to do really anything that is not directly off of a JIRA board. So thank you all. It was nice meeting you. And uh, hopefully we'll talk soon. All right. Bye, everyone. This is great. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you.